talk a little bit about the adversity you were facing when it came to, you know, wanting to, to play college tennis. What were people saying about you? I had my first rude awakening when I played uh, you. <laughs> I got my head beat in at uh, Ottawa Park, like 6-1, like 13, 14 minutes in the first set. And it was just, Gio, you got to do a lot of work. Um, I talked to you, I think, after that match about, you know, what do you think my chances are and what it looks like, you know? And you said uh, it's going to be a hard road, you know? So I appreciated the honesty, but uh, I had bigger goals, and I wasn't going to allow that to stop me in a sense. People said all the time, you know, you won't play in college. You started too late. Um, you never play professional. You started, you know, most pros are starting at four years old, and they don't make it. Yeah. Um, but I didn't, for me, it was just always – get better, get better, get better. And it became a little frustrating at first when the, the results didn't match the work that I assumed I was putting in at the time. But I believe if you got if you feel like you can push a little more, you got almost a half a half to a full tank left. Absolutely. So. Man, and, and the funny thing is, I don't know if you remember this. I, I actually remember that. And my whole point of, of that match when I played you was, you know, and this is something I learned as I've gotten older is, you know, it just takes so much work to get to where you want to get to, no matter where you're trying to go in life. You know what I'm saying? Like, if someone comes to you, Gio, and is like, oh, I can beat you or I can play in college right now. And you go out and play them. You're like, I'm sorry, bro. Like, you got you got to work. You can do it, but you're not going to do it like this. And I still remember when I was in Charlotte and I came down to hit with you. And I was like, whoa, this is not the kid I hit with a few years back. Like, you were hitting clean, you you could ball. And I mean, you were a college player. So just to see in such a short period of time, how you became so successful um, and played at that level um, is, is, is amazing. You know what I mean? But I'm sure you would say there's no blueprint to it. You'll probably, what were the couple things that allowed you to do that? Uh, well, I, I thought I had a cheat code, honestly. Um, training with, at that time, collegiate players. Now I'm thinking back on it. It's like that was outlandish. It's like there was that's unheard of for you to yeah. change the public kid. Um, but training with some of the college players, getting to see you guys practice every once in a while, even if it was in the off season, like the off season practices, I got to just sneak around and watch from up the hill. Um, it's like okay, these are what these guys are doing. This is what I want to do. But in tennis, I think tennis is a tennis is an absolute sport. You get exactly what you deserve on the day you get on court. Yeah. Um, you can't hide. Your flaws, they're going to be exposed. So if you haven't, if you've, if you've been on accelerator. One other question for you too, Gio. Um, you said it earlier, but can you go back and just tell us like how you got into tennis now that you're on the clear picture? <laughs> okay. Uh, I got into tennis, like I said, it was an accident. Um, my mom was late. I was trying to, I was trying out for track uh, and my mom was late for practice. So I waited outside of school, Rogers, and there was a guy on the tennis court with two rackets. I saw him out there playing by himself, and I thought that was pretty weird. And I'm like, okay, well, you do you mind? He said, yeah, it's cool. Um, Zachary Sullivan's a good guy. Um, he said, uh, sure, man. We played for a little while, and I kept hitting balls over the fence. He would laugh, and that just was infuriating to me. I'm like, man, there's a sport that I just can't be athletic in, just come out and just be okay, at least be average. That boiled me to a point where it was just like, well, this is what I want to do. And yeah. me and my man, we trained every day. I, I had I was lucky, I had a, a rival that happened to me, my best friend. He loved the sport as much as I did, Aaron Watkins. Um, and we trained every day. And I got lucky. I was, like you said, a community. So when I first went to Ottawa Park, there was a group of older black guys just chilling out there. Gary Doherty, uh, George Rios, uh, Smith, um, Bobby Johnson, all these older guys, Bobby Roberts and uh, Ethel Parker, a bunch of these, these old uh, people are just – they, they showed love. Yeah. They, they didn't shy away. And I worked with the guy every day in the summer from like 12 to 9 o'clock. His name was Carlos Harris. And he was just like, you know, outside of tennis, he, he taught me a lot of stuff. And he, we made sure we maintained the courts. I remember he came, picked me up. We cut the grass out there. It's just, if this is your home, you take care of your home. Yeah. And you come here and play every day and you're able to do that, you need to take care of your home. So that, that was my introduction to tennis and it became a love, a real love. Yeah, that's what's up. Yeah, that's what's up, man. And I think you're, to your point of just like taking care of home and, and learning the little things, like there's so much to tennis and it's not all about just hitting the ball over the net, right? 
You got to do the little things like you got to study the game. You got to work out. You got to put the time in off the court mentally, physically to be prepared to do your best on the court. And I always laugh because we're lucky enough to see people perform. Right. Like I can come watch you play and you can come watch me play. But a lot of times people don't get to see the the behind the scenes work, the, the, the screaming, the yelling, the injuries, the the tears, you know, that come with wins the losses like a lot of people don't see that so um just to hear you you know build such an appreciation for the game is special and and on that note thinking about it I know you're you've coached in college and evolved you as a person and I'm just curious like what is what has it meant to you to be you know a black male coach um uh being a black coach is especially in the South, it's, uh, it's a little different. There are definitely, it's not what you know, it's who you know, a lot of times. Yeah. Um, even here in the South where I'm at, man, when I first moved here, just as a player, trying to find better players to play with, they weren't having it. Not unless they can see you can, you got to be on court. Like, it's not like a, hey, come out and hit. They have to already on accident seeing you play, you know, and then they got to see that you're a baller. And then once you start playing more often, you got to get out. Tennis forces you to be you know, social. You got to get out and meet new people. Yeah. Um, that's how you get your game better. So uh, it was just being a black coach in the South, man, it's much, it's, it's tough. It's tough. Sometimes um, people that don't look like you don't subscribe to what you, what you know. They don't feel like you know. They don't feel like the skill level is there, especially if you didn't have an illustrious junior career. And sometimes people in our neighborhoods, you know, if you don't look like their image of tennis, do you know anything? Do you have the skill sets to teach? Um, and it's all just, it's work, man. It comes down just to work. You have to be able to do the work. You got to be able to, we know that those certain restrictions and certain customs live out here or exist in the world, but you have to, you, if you're putting in the work with honest heart and honest intent, well, it'll show, it'll show. Yeah, that's real because what you just said is, is is so true. Like if I call, like if if I'm in the South or even even places in the North, man, and I'm like, hey, I'm looking for a couple of good guys, you know, a couple of good juniors to hit with. You know, me personally, I know I can still ball, right? Like I believe my game, my serve, like I can still play. That's how confident I am in what I do. And if you're in the South, to your point or other places, someone has to see you hitting balls like, oh, OK, this guy can play. Yeah, I want to get him in our group. But if you just go up and ask, like, hey, I'm new to the area, um, I want to hit with you guys. They'd be like, eh, I don't know about that. Like, I'm not trying to waste my time with you and I invite you out. And it's funny because I wish I had a dollar for the number of times people when I was new and to your point, tennis being very social. I went up to someone and they allowed me to hit and like, oh man, I'm so glad you're good, man. Because, you know, I just thought you weren't going to be that good. And the reality is, is it's because I'm black. They probably didn't think I was going to be that good. I mean, a lot of people don't want to say that, but that's just the, the, the reality. Right. Yeah. And then you have certain, I, I found that uh, you have certain athletes or black players in general, the, the scope is that they're going to be really athletic. They're going to, and, and sometimes a lot of times when we are brought up, they're, you're taught to have, you know, you be fast, you be strong, you hit a big forehand, you need to attack to big targets, you know, but it's so much more than that. So the, I guess the notion would be that we don't have the, the mental aspect of it. And I think that that is, that is definitely drastically changing. Absolutely. And my goal, especially with toss and spin, like I just have a vision of making tennis look more reflective of what the world looks like. It's, it's people like you and me, right? It isn't this, quote unquote, country club sport anymore. It's it's a sport that people can play for the rest of their lives, right? Like as much as I love to hoop, you're not going to see me set foot on a basketball court because <laughs> it's just not going to be good. But you will see me continue to set foot on a tennis court at any age um, because I know that's it's just something I, I enjoy to do. And, and one of the things um, I'm hoping you can elaborate a little bit more on is talk about some of the the, the setbacks you've had just – you know, as a player, as a coach, whatever, whatever it may be, you know, I, I know you've had setbacks and I know you, you're still standing here to tell me about those setbacks. So um, can you talk a little bit about that? 
big setbacks that I've had for sure. But uh, the, I guess the biggest setback that I've had as a coach is learning how to manage a your professional life and your personal life. Um, three years ago, four years ago, in a couple of days, yeah. my mother passed, and I had to go home for that and take care of some some business with the family. But in the midst of doing that, uh, I lost all my hours at work. I wasn't able to teach on court. I wasn't doing junior developments. There was no court time for private lessons. Um, me coming back, I had to resign from that job while going through a grievance. But there's, you got to be consistent. So, and then searching for new jobs as a black coach down here, you know, it's tough. But there's definitely um, some, there's good people everywhere. Right. All skin colors. So uh, I was able to, uh, to find a, another job here working at a public facility for South Haven. And I worked there continuously for about three years, nonstop, grew my clientele base, but it was having to start over from ground zero in a city that I'm not from down in Memphis. So it was definitely uh, a building block. It, you have to you have to check your ego. And I say all the time that ego is nothing but edging God out. So you have to check that. Make sure you're in order and you will be humble. So you wanna be able to go through this this, as you traverse through your career and as you grow um, with, a, with a clear mind. Yeah. And being humble, man, is, is one of the things I think is going to get you, it's going to get me, it's going to get anybody to the next level because, you know, you never want to be a person who doesn't have humility. Um, it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to still be learning. You don't have to know it all. And one of the things, and I'll be honest, like, why I transitioned from corporate to doing my own business in this court. If I don't know it, it's okay. You know, I'm in my wheelhouse and I feel like I, I really believe this is what, you know, God intended me to be doing. And just to hear, you know, I still remember when your mom passed and um, I just remember, you know, it's mom. Like, I don't, whether people are close with their mom, not it, like, you know, you lose your mom, that's, that's always hard. You lose a relative, you lose your father, you lose anybody in your family it's always hard. So hearing you come back from that and work your way back after you lost, you know what I'm saying? All those, all those lessons, man, and is, is special. And I think, you know, I always live by this quote is a setback is a setup for a comeback because in life, we're always going to have setbacks, but it's about getting back up. It's about feeling strong and, and figuring out how do you continue to move forward? That's right. I think so. I definitely agree with that. Uh, I think it's just discipline most important letter in the word discipline is I. It show up three times. Yeah. Uh, if, you don't do, if I don't do the work, it won't get done. Yes, sir. The last question I have for you today, you know, it's really important for me to, to give back to people, to give back to the game, to, to try to help people in any way I can. Like that's, I feel like a purpose of everybody on the earth is like to to figure out how you can help others, right? Um, because I believe that's just what we should do. And, you know, I'm wondering what advice would you give to, you know, a player who wants to be a college tennis player, a college athlete, or a coach who, you know, who wants to get into tennis coaching? What, what advice would you give them? Um, you got to know your material. It's okay to, to study different schools of thought. It's okay to look at other people's teaching styles and find the goods in them. Uh, you want to be able to teach things to a five-year-old. That's what I would say. If you could teach a five-year-old, you could teach an 80-year-old. Yeah. Um, if you can get, you want to get into college coaching, college coaching is, is, is mainly your recruiting skills, your, your, uh, your, your reasoning skills, your cognitive reasoning skills, mm -hmm. you being personable, your personality. And your ability to uh, be your person, your, your ability to find the root cause and find the cure for that. Yeah. So you have to be able to find people that can mesh. You have to be a good judgment of character. Um, and you got to do the work, the repetition. The players are going to want to know, even if you if you can't play, that's fine. But players want to know that you know what you're talking about. They want to be able to see the game from a different perspective. That's your job. A lot of players, they don't understand when you get to college, the coaches aren't necessarily working on your technique. At that point, you're how, how it's seen from the business aspect. You're just an employee. You come in, you do the job. You fit within the scheme or you don't. 
You know, and if you don't, if you don't fit within the scheme, we'll find a better employee. You know, um, but it's, are you coachable? As a coach, are you coachable? Are you willing to sit under another coach at the school and learn their recruitment strategies? How is it? And as a tennis, as a tennis coach, man, it's a non-revenue sport. So the scholarship budgets usually aren't that big. So you have to be a businessman. You have to be a business, a businessman or woman. You got to be willing to, to go out and uh, put yourself into, immerse yourself in the community, build some rapport within the community, go out and play some small tournaments, go out and meet the community, have some high school days. You know, you gotta, you have to be innovative in the way that you coach, especially a non-revenue sport like tennis. Wow. Gio, man, you're a smart dude. <laughs> um, I'm laughing because like you just said so many things that are like really important. One, it's about recruiting and finding players that are going to, you know, the puzzle pieces that are going to fit right into your program. You know what I mean? Like sometimes you can go out and be like, yo, this is the best, you know, number five or number six player in the country who can play on my team. This is what I need. I need someone strong at the back of the line. Or you're like, I'm losing my best players. I got to go out and find a stud. I got to go out and find someone who can play. But also you want people with good character because a lot of coaches that I've interviewed have told me, you know, coach, being on court, is just a piece of it, a small piece. A lot of things happen off the court managing the business and I like how you said you got to be innovative because you know everybody wants a bigger budget are you just the first stop if your first stop is to your athletic director telling him I need more money that's not going to happen but if your first stop is like how can we get out in the community and let people know about our team we can do fundraisers we can give back we can do things for kids that brings revenue back into your program so um, I, I just like how you're thinking from that perspective and the thing I really like about it is you can take a lot of those skills you've learned, you know, on college coaching and apply them to so many different things. Because, you know, if you think of a college program as running a small company, I mean, in, in one way, shape or form, that's what it is. Right. Players don't perform. They they can lose their scholarship. Same thing. Employees don't perform. They can lose their job. I mean, it's there's a lot of, you know, commonalities when you think about it like that. I think. Um... The, the best the best advice that I could give to current college coaches, especially at uh, smaller schools, is you have to be willing to anything that you ask for. You have to be willing to pay double. Hmm. So if I know that my budget is small, well, I'm going to show you that these are these are my recruitment strategies. This is what I've done. I don't want to just come to you with problems. I'm coming to you with solutions. So. I know that we're running low on a budget here. I'm going to have a fundraiser for that to compensate that. Also, I know that the mandatory, the, the GPA minimum is 2.5 to play. Well, it's a minimum of a 2.9 here. I want to, I want my players to contribute to the overall success of the sports programs as far as academically yeah. and of the overall success of the school academically. That shines better. I take pride in knowing I have a 100% graduation rate and a matriculation rate. You don't step on court if you have less than a, uh, a semester 2.9 GPA. Yeah. It doesn't happen. Right. So I, and, and if I'm asking that of the players, then I also have to be willing to email professors or set up study more study halls, dedicate more time to them, yeah. finding tutors, finding scholarships, helping them, directing them in the right department. Don't, you need to go and talk to the scholarship department. You, you need to be a regular face on campus. That's what coaching is to me. Like you're embedded in that lifestyle. You're embedded in, or well, you're entrenched in investing in these and the growth of your students and what's next for them. As a coach, I don't just coach you guys on court, but it's a life coaching sense. What's next for you? You guys are going to be here for four years. Four years, you do it correctly. Okay, what's next? No. Yeah have an internship are we going to have four master's program these are things that we need to be thinking about for sure because i mean the reality is that everybody doesn't go on to play pro a matter of fact it's less than one percent so i think when you think about holistically about a college program it needs to be about tennis it does it's true that's what you're there for um but it also needs to be about building those life skills um and like you said are you a good person off the court? Can you leverage skills that you learned during tennis and put them into a professional setting? It doesn't have to be corporate. It could be entrepreneur. It could be whatever. 
Um, but I just think there's, you know, tennis is one piece of it, but it seems like you, you know, you built a, an entire program um, and a, a standard for excellence. And I think that's what it's, that's what it's about, building good people, building a program and building the right standards of excellence so that you can build good people to go out into the world and do even better things. Calculated risks. Yes, no, sir. That's right. I love it. Man, listen, let me tell you something. This was great. It was good to catch up with you. 